Hi there, I'm Graham Fitch and I'm coming to you from London um, for this month's live practice clinic. Welcome everybody um, to this Facebook clinic and if you're watching on Facebook please put all the uh, comments underneath where you're from, where you're watching from, press the like button of course and if you're on YouTube uh, later hit the subscribe um, so that you can hear from us whenever we put anything new out, which is quite often. So the way that the practice clinics work is that Online Academy subscribers send in questions in advance and I address them in the clinic, hopefully relating to practice, but of course we do get questions about technical issues and stylistic issues as well. And I've moved my camera back a little bit this time so that you can see more of the keyboard. Um, I still see that it's not ideal. Let me push it back a little bit further still because I'm aware that I'm getting chopped off on the top. But anyway, uh, it doesn't matter. You don't need to see me as long as you can see the keyboard and you can see my hands. So the first question comes to us from Ying. Um, and this is the question. The Bagatelle in E flat, number one, opus 33 by Beethoven. I have a hard time practicing the right hand double notes in bars 19 to 20. Can you give me some suggestions on how to practice these two bars and how to play fast and evenly? And then there's another question which I'll get to in a minute. Ying, okay, yeah, so let's look a little bit at this bagatelle. It's rather sweet. I love these bagatelles. Uh, little miniatures. So what we've got here is, is a, open, a very kind of tranquil uh, opening. Um, so we're playful a bit. Uh, It's not legato. I would go with a non-legato touch. There's no connections written. Beethoven writes connections where he wants earlier on in the piece. Legato. Um, he even writes legato for the left hand as if we needed to be told we would probably have done that. Staccato's here. Slur. So he, he does not write any markings above these thirds which leads me to deduce that they're slightly separated. So don't try to play them legato, that's the first thing. Now, if we look at these double notes, we've got a, the interval of a fourth there played with three and one on two black keys. Then I've got four and two on two white keys, and then I've got five and three on a black and a white. Now, if I were to play those in isolation from each other, I would discover that I need slightly different hand positions for each one. I can't lock my hand and play them from, from a fixed hand. I have to move. So the way I would move in and up for the two blacks, out for the two whites, just enough so that my fourth, second fingers are not in the black key area, just slightly out, and then a tiny little adjustment so I feel the, the direction of the, the grouping of those notes comes from the thumbs. So did you, did you notice how I come out and then hook around? That's uh, just the choreography. Now, if you look at what Beethoven's done is he set up a hemiola in that bar. A, a hemiola is simply uh, shifting the metrics of the bar from Two in a bar. One, uh, two, one, two, one, two, six, eight, right? So in this bar, instead of it being 
one and two. I can't even do it. It's actually one and two and three and four. Can't count it any other way. Hemiola, one and two and three and. That's the musical grouping, but I think the technical grouping is from the thumbs. So in terms of practice, Ying, what I would do would be to practice occasionally just taking the top by itself and the underneath by itself a little lighter. And with any double notes, we can make a kind of formula for practice. A double tap on the top. tenuto quality and when I do the double tap on the bottom with a leggero a staccato quality because I want the lower note to be slightly lighter just for good sound quality I can also practice like this breaking the thirds and fourth and then the other way useful uh, plan and then finally I would just do a little bit of chaining maybe from the thumb to the fourth two and then until that's comfortable and then again and then you would chain backwards from here to here and then maybe do you see how that all works break it up now, the other part of Ying's question was, I also had trouble at bar 81. I'm not sure how to play um, the right hand with the left hand accompaniment. Yes, okay. So what we've got, Beethoven has given a group of eight in the right hand against a group of three in the left hand. So we've got effectively an eight against a three. How are we supposed to do that? Well, there's a, there's a way I would suggest of doing this for practice. If you make the 8, 3 plus 3 plus 2, you get this. 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 1. So I practice that first. And now I move the group of 2 around. So maybe I start now with a group of 2. 1, 2, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3. Maybe now I put the group of 2 in the middle. Now I fudge it. In other words, when I play, it, the final performance style is not so strictly 3 plus 3 plus 2, although that would work if you can't manage it any other way. But I would just allow that to bend a little bit. You've got to realise why composers do this sort of stuff. An 8 against a 3 is deliberately obscuring the, the rhythmical outline, isn't it? It's, it's creating a kind of smudge, a rhythmical smudge. So it does not want to sound too regular. I would not play my groove of eight. Ta, 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 ta. You know, there's a little bit of flexibility. Coda. It's a, it's a really light-hearted, charming piece, pastoral kind of quality music. I, I think it's great. The next question is from Will, who is having difficulty with the first Alberti bass in Beethoven's Opus 10, number 2, from bar 30 onwards. Yes, I, I'm not surprised. It's actually really tricky. Um, my fingers get stuck in the black keys, and it's hard to find a good fingering for the bass note. Okay. Um, the, the stress of playing it makes it hard to play softly. Thank you for your help. Okay, well, I, I've been having a look at this uh, this morning and just sort of figuring out some fingering. So this is the left, this is the spot. Uh, now the left hand, if I play it by itself, you've got two things. You've got a bass line turning around a G. And you've got little kind of fragments phrasing in the right hand. Beethoven loves giving us banana skins to slip up on. These Schwarzandos kind of offbeat. Uh... So now I'm not playing 
a complete left hand. The left hand has an extra element, the water element, if you will, the, the bubbling sextuplets. The two words. It's tricky. But let's take it apart a little bit. You need two levels of sound. First of all, play the left hand lighter than the right hand anyway, but start off by just taking the, the crutches, the quarter notes in the bottom, and just giving them a little shake. Now the fingering I like, five, four, five, four on the black key, because it leaves you with two and one to play the upper notes, very comfortable. Back to the five, four, five, four, then slide off, four, five, four, five, and you notice how flexible Everything is down there. Uh, above that, we've got the sextuplet groups, which need to be really light, almost staccato in quality. So I've got to practice staccato, but just super light. It's also helpful to feel the rhythmical design in the left hand with a, maybe the tiniest little accent there. Bar 31, I would go with a 5 2 1 to prepare the fourth finger for the F sharp. In this particular edition, the 2 is only at the end of the group, so they're expecting you to do a 3, then change to a 2. But I like to ch change to, to a 2 at the beginning of the bar, so 3, bar 1, bar 30, and now 5 2 1 2. 4, 2, 1, 2, then I avoid that problem of being trapped in the black key area. 5. Now this is a little trickier. You can slide off the F sharp. Slide, go move in a little bit for the pinky on the F sharp. See how I'm going back to the back of the key. Just a little bit. I'm probably exaggerating it, but I don't want you to miss it. Out. There's a kind of hinge feeling there. So for practice, um, you could take the first part of the group right? You could take the second half starting from the and and some pedal but I as I was exploring this just now um, you can't I couldn't write in the pedaling that I, I'm using uh, because it's too it's not black and white it's not pedaling by the quarter because then I get eh, not not so great but I'm using my pedal I think I'm just dipping down where I want a little resonance which leads me to the another point if the left hand long note at the bottom were not to be held, then we would just use it. We could perhaps just use a bit more pedal and let go of the pinky fingers. Which would work very well if I were playing the left hand by itself. However, I do think we need to hear the articulation in the right hand. Short. And we need to hear the line on the bottom. Do we need to play legato underneath? Preferably, if you can't, you could lift the pinky finger on the uh, last uh, note of the sextuplet group, which would give you a little bit of freedom. Also help or could possibly help if you can't manage to hold but whatever you do don't key bed on the crotchet the quarters at the bottom so there's no pressure in those long notes and you'll see that you see how flexible my hand is uh, no pushing into the key um, finally in, in the final analysis if we've got a really good quality right hand plenty of character the Sportsandos phrase off. If we've got that happening and we've got a good sense of line in the lower left hand, 
then does it really matter if every single sextuplet node is maybe, if for one or two, I mean, is slightly out of focus? I don't think anybody's going to ask for their money back. Um, and I could imagine perhaps a, a great pianist in recital who didn't have perhaps as much time to practice as they want, really going for the character of the right hand, supporting with that bass line, and just hoping and praying that the thumb and the second finger would create the impression that Beethoven's after. So go for the impression, go for the character, quality of right hand, supporting the bass, and just don't stress too much. And I, I, I'm surprised that I hear myself saying that because I'm normally very particular that we go for every note, but it's more a state of mind. Yes, go for every note and you, as you practice. When you play, don't stress about that. So put your attention elsewhere um, on, on the right hand. Diana is currently learning Chopin's Mazurka in G minor, opus 67, number two. Um, the first and last sections are coming and she feels more happy with her progress. But in the middle section, bars 22 to 24, uh, she doesn't feel secure. Any suggestions to make this more secure would be most welcome, please. OK, so this is the Mazurka um, that starts like this. Uh, Seventeen, a little something, a little jumpier. Um. Now this is the spot Diana's talking about. So again, fingering is important here, uh, and I'm often just going for the left hand first, just to make sure that that's really secure, even if the difficulty appears to be in the right hand. Um, which it probably is, but the finger two in the uh, two, three, shift, two, three, similarly, two, three, two, three, uh, so that you get a legato within the bar, shift. So I'm feeling the connection between two and three, and that stabilizes my, my left hand, makes that really nice uh, sensations. Right hand we've got the melodic line on the top so and something that's going on in the, the thumb. Can you see what's going on there? The thumb has to move chromatically. So I would recommend playing the, the right thumb line against the left hand, move the pedal. Light thumb. That's rather uh, satisfying to hear that uh, right thumb and the left hand to get acting as one kind of uh, group of, of notes that, the harmony if you will. On the top of that, breathe. Look at Chopin's uh, phrase markings. I happen to have the, uh, well, the Polish edition, the Paderewski edition. This is phrased in one. Break, breathe through the wrist. Breathe, here again. So when you put the, uh, when you play the top line by itself, do you notice how mobile I am? that if I locked my hand. So free, move. I feel a little circle in the triplet. So when I add my thumb, at some point I have to let go of the thumb because I've got to move it from the B natural to the B flat. Probably move it pretty quickly, release it pretty quickly. Come up and around, move in a little bit so that the thumb can be comfortable on the black key. Release the hand. Now, see, I'm getting my legato from my top line. 
here, lift the thumb, but connect three to two. Lift everything. Lift. Okay, so then when you want to put that together, I would suggest breaking the phrases up, playing maybe just the, 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 the what's no, what notes are under the phrases. Take your time. And when I stop at the end of the phrase, what I'm doing is I'm spending a little moment reflecting on how I did. In other words, did that work? Was that correct? Did it sound good? Was it comfortable in my body? And then I'm also preparing what I've got to do next, mentally rehearsing, focusing on what the next activity is. And when I'm ready, yes, I'm happy with that, get ready. And what you will discover, Diana, is that the gaps that you need to take to prepare get shorter and shorter until you just don't need them at all. But we still need to hear the phrasing. So that's not metronomically square. I hope that gives you some ideas. And the last question is from Ralph, who adores Chopin's Berceurs. I don't blame you, Ralph, so do I. But he always comes adrift in the right-hand chordal section in bars 35 to 36. If you could give me some ideas for practice, I would be very grateful. Well, I will, yes. So the Berceuse is a very special piece. You've got this idea of the, the repetition of this tonic dominant. You can feel the cradle rocking. So the, right, the left hand is the mother figure pushing the cradle and then off again. So when it's at this place, it's tonic, right? She pushes it away, dominant, it swings back to the tonic. Dominant, tonic. So you create that swing. And the right hand is the baby. starts to fall asleep um, he, he can he or she can dream ever more fantastic dreams certain in the safety that the mother is there for the baby pushing it's the most beautiful thing exquisite so there are 16 variations if you will and the left hand stays identical when I say identical sometimes the voice the voice lead, not the voice leading the, the layout of the chord changes sometimes we get the seventh in the bass and the times it, when the seventh is in the right hand the laws of harmony dictate that you're not supposed to double so you know he has to rejig sometimes it's that sometimes it's that but it's effectively the same music so the, the spot that Ralph is uh, finding difficult is bars 35 and 36 if I do it slowly uh, for my benefit as anybody else's but no I will show you um, how to how to work on that so the first thing is just forget the pedal for the moment and just see if you can get from one hand position to the next as close to the keyboard as possible the fingering is all important I'm assuming you've got a good fingering but you'll notice that I'm not lifting uh, I'm not lifting away from the keyboard and neither am I flopping around with my wrist. I want my wrists to stay part of my arm, not floppy. Uh, this, otherwise I won't have any control over my sound if I sort of flop into the keyboard. So just straight down, top to bottom, move, move directly and just sense those different hand positions. I'm gonna give you some ideas for developing the sense 
first thing I would recommend would be to uh, play lines by themselves. This is the top line. I'm only going to deal with the first bar because otherwise you're going to get really bored. What I do in the first bar will apply to the second bar and you could either practice the first bar and work on all of the different stages in that bar before you move to the second bar or you could do it all in one longer chunk. But I'm taking top, the top line, whoops, let me do that better. I need to be really familiar with that voice by itself because when, when all is said and done, we've got a three note chord on each 16th note in each semiquaver. And we have to feel not like a lump in the hand, but we've got teamwork. Five aside team is my hand here. So I need to individuate each line. Use the fingers that you'll end up using. Don't use any old finger. Now I take the middle line, if you will, the padding in the middle. There, that needs a bit of concentration. Let me concentrate. <laughs> doesn't sound like anything by itself, but that's all played with my second finger. And my second finger really needs to know where it's going. Uh, yes. I notice there I've got two Cs, two G flats, three G flats, four G flats, five. So I get to know that second finger line. Then I do the same with my thumb. before I start putting them together a little bit. Maybe I just take the top two. You notice how I'm voicing? A bit more on the top. Yeah, I'm happy with the quality of the sound there. And then maybe I'll take the lowest notes. take the outer notes. In other words, I'm missing out the middle note now. Now I'm going to play all three notes together, but I want to double tap my top note. Tenuto style. to do that metrically you could do three taps for the, for the duplets and then two taps for the triplets so then I preserve the, the duplet versus triplet groups when I practice it's kind of satisfying now I'm going to do the same thing with the middle finger cheated with my fingering. Really catch yourself, be honest with yourself when you practice. I, I could have let that go. I could have said, oh yes, I know I made a mistake. It'll be better tomorrow or I'll get it right the next time. No, when you're practicing, go back, get it right. So now my second finger is being released. And play very softly. Now twos. And then I would do the same job with my thumb. Then I could do the same job with a pair of fingers. Let's say I held onto the middle finger and released my outer fingers. That's challenging, especially when you're talking over the top of it. I could hold onto my top finger and double tap or triple tap the underneath fingers. Um, that would work as well. So that process if you repeat that process daily for i don't know a few days go back to square one each time i, I can almost guarantee that you'll start to feel after a, a few days that that starts to yield but that's not all i would do i would also do some chaining practice i think first thing i would want to do would be to make sure i can get from this chord to this chord actually quicker than i need then from this one to this one 
you see. So I'm making each chord an acciaccatura to the next. Then I can start doing a bit of chaining. Just make sure that's really comfortable. I can do that with the left hand as well. Um, but let me just sit with the right hand. Now I notice my second finger isn't actually very centered on that. So perhaps I take this little group and just work on that little group. So I can, you know, explore maybe some jumps are harder than others. That one, I can work on that corner until I've got the whole phrase connected up. So the solution lies in technique, of course, if you're flopping with a wrist or if you've got bad fingering, but also the process of practicing. That's also technique. People forget that practice method is also technique. So is style. Um, yeah, so I hope that does give you some ideas, Ralph. Um, we could spend hours just taking this basseuse to pieces with specific, you know, practice ideas. Maybe I'll do that one day in a video. But anyway, that brings me to the end of the clinic. I, I hope you enjoyed it. Um, thank you all very much for watching. Thank you for sending in your questions. And I will be back here next month for uh, the next practice clinic. So look out for that. Thank you so much. See you soon. Bye bye.